Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Wow. I hope I can live up to half of that tonight. Good to see you, Ritz. Amen. Thank you for coming tonight. How many of you love the Lord on this beautiful Thursday night? Amen. How many of you are so grateful God is every day on your side? Amen. Amen. You know, uh, I'm from West Texas, and it's already spring and getting close to summer. It's nice and warm there. And I was walking around last night complaining how cold I was, walking around today complaining how cold I was. And then I thought about you people from South Dakota and Denmark. This has got to feel like summer to you. Amen. You're probably ready to go swimming. Wow. Wow. Amen. There is deliverance. All right. Well, you ready to get in the word tonight? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you tonight for another opportunity to come here to this great, this great part of your church, your house, where you said your eyes would be and your heart would be always. And Lord, we thank you that here tonight in your house, there's no place we could be anywhere on the earth, but we have more of your attention for right here, right now, because this is where your eyes are, and this is where your heart is, in your house. So we ask you tonight to speak to us. We've come here tonight to worship you. We've come here tonight to give. We've come here tonight to encourage other people by them seeing us here, but Lord, we've come to learn. So we ask you to speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to take you on a real quick journey tonight. I'll probably have you out by 10, 15, 10, 30. Be nice, nice and quick. All right. Uh, at the end of last year, uh, I, me and my, my children and our leadership team, we uh, spent quite a bit of time, as we do every year, just seeking the Lord to see if there's any particular direction or anything that he has to say for us for the upcoming year. Some years he does have something to say. Some years he doesn't say anything. We just go on doing what we do. And, but last year, coming into this year, there was one word that kept coming back to us over and over again. And I believe that, that it was a word not just for abundant living in El Paso or for me or my church family, but for all of us. And uh, the Bible says that the scripture is not open to private interpretation, right? So it's, it's whatever God speaks to one, he speaks to all. Can I hear a good amen, right? So, uh, and that word that kept coming up to us was the simple word, grow. Grow. And so everything that we're doing at our church, and I'm doing personally in my personal life, is to grow. And it's a word that you hear a lot about in Christianity. It's a word you hear a lot about in pastor's conferences. A lot of times pastors gather together, uh, church leaders gather together. We want to talk about growing, about growth. And, and, and really, that's accurate. That's correct. It, we, we should be thinking that way. God desires for each of us to grow. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, uh, the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, that God has given to us gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, that we might all grow up into him in all things and as a result, no longer be children. All right, it's all right to be born as a baby in Christ. The Bible says that and then you grow into childhood and then hopefully you grow into spiritual sonship or daughtership. You become an adult in God's kingdom that we grow. Now, as I began to look at this and study this, I discovered something very interesting. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? All right. Uh, uh, what, those of you who have never heard me don't know me. The better you respond, the quicker you get out. So there we go. Amen. If you're not responding, then I think you're not getting it. And the teacher in me insists then that I go over it and over it and over it and over it and over it. Amen? There you go. You're going to get out early now, right? So there you are. All right? Quick learners. Okay? So, uh, so first of all, you know, me being a Bible teacher, I've always got to look words up. I'm always very curious about definitions. And a part of that comes out of my childhood when my dad, who didn't say a lot to me when I was growing up, but one day 
I'd gotten in trouble at school, and he sat me down, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, what, what's, what's the issue here, right? And I said, well, you know, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't like this. I, 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 don't, I don't like this class. I don't like the teacher. I really don't like school. And uh, my dad looked at me, and he gave me a, a real bit of wisdom, and I'll quote it to you the right, exactly the way he said it to me. He said, son, ain't no blessing on being dumb. I'll let that soak in for a minute right there, right? <laughs> Ain't no blessing on being dumb, right? So I must have looked at him like, you know, and he said, son, ain't nobody going to pay you good money to be dumb. You're not going to marry a beautiful woman being dumb. You're not going to get a nice car being dumb. You're not going to live in a great house being dumb. Have you got it? Ain't no blessing on being dumb. Right? Garth Brooks could make a song out of that, couldn't he? I'll just, I may sell that title to him right there, all right? And so as a result of that, I began, just came, get this, I have this insatiable desire to grow, to learn, to, to learn new things, right? Because ain't no blessing on being dumb. And so as, as God began to speak this word into my life, so I got out a dictionary, secular dictionary, and, and I discovered the word grow has these incredible definitions. Would you listen to them? Maybe even think about writing them down. Listen, number one, it means to increase gradually in size or amount. To increase gradually. Now, that's a word that most Christians don't like. We don't like to increase gradually. Right? We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like the gradual part. Of, we, don't, we don't like it, right? I want to go from A to Z tonight. I want drive through. Right? Pastor, don't talk to me about coming to church for eight weeks. Just lay your hands on me tonight. That's it. I just. Hmm? But that's not how you grow. The word grow means to increase gradually in size or amount. To increase gradually. So is the kingdom of God. So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. And the seed should spring and grow up. He knows not how. First the blade. Then the ear. Then the full corn in the ear. I can't take it anymore. Then the harvest comes. We don't want that. We just want harvest. But let me remind you something tonight in case you have forgotten. It's not called the kingdom of Mary or the kingdom of John or the kingdom of Ralph. It's called the kingdom of God. It's their kingdom. And inside that kingdom, they do things their way. Now, that's really hard on American Christians. All right. He continued. The word grow means to become mature or experienced. I love this one. To increase in influence or effect. To increase in influence or effect. That one really grabs me. Because if there's anything in my life as I want to be influential and be effective. I don't want to waste my time. I want to be effective. If I'm going to come in here tonight and talk to you, I want to be effective. Yes. Yes. Amen? It also means to fix, to, be, to become fixed, here it comes again, gradually in your mind or your affections. Get your mind fixed so it's not bouncing all around all the time. Your affections fixed, right? So you're not bouncing all around all the time. I love this, I love that, I love them, I don't love them, I love her, I love him, I don't know what I love. I love ice cream, I don't love ice cream, right? Uh, rang, 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 rang. You know what I'm talking about, right? Your emotions, your affections are all over the place. That's okay when you're three, but it's not cool when you're 33. And it's really bad when you're 53. Hmm? And your mind is all over the place, so you gotta grow. Can I get a good amen tonight, right? The synonyms are multiply, swell, enlarge, expand, extend. I love this, originate. Hmm? To grow means to be, to originate, to create. Did you catch that, right? To create new things. To originate also means to raise, as in to raise the bar. Now, that's great, but then I, I went into the Bible and I began to look at the word grow. You still with me? 
And I came across these two incredible verses of Scripture in Luke, the second chapter. And I discovered in Luke, the second chapter, that there's two words used for grow in the New Testament. All right? The first one is found in verse 40. And it says, and Jesus grew. There it is. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Look at the word grow there. That word grow simply means, in the Greek text, which the New Testament was written in, right, there is a form of growth. And that growth is, is that you grow because you have the spirit of life in you. You grow because you have life in you. Hmm? It's like a baby's born and it grows. It doesn't have to do anything to grow. It doesn't have to make itself grow. It just grows. And, but, and that form of growing is really good. But there comes a time in your life where you quit growing up. Now, you may still keep growing. Just seeing if you're still listening, all right? So that type of growing has a, an end point to it, right? You grow physically. So Jesus, like all of us, grew physically. But look at the second verse, verse 52. That he uses a different word. And Jesus, in the King James it says increase, but in the, in the literal Greek it says, and Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, or spiritual maturity, and in favor with God and man. So he grew. Now that word grow there is very interesting. This is the part I want to emphasize in your life, right? Listen to this. That part there literally means that he was self-motivated and conscious of advancing. So he was self-motivated. Is nobody going to make me grow, this grow, but me? I can remain a, a spiritual child for the rest of my life. Never have influence, never be effective, never create, never originate, never raise the bar, never achieve the things God wants me to do. I'm still in the kingdom. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven, but I didn't grow. Why? Because I wasn't self-motivated to grow. Jesus was self-motivated to grow. Where? In wisdom, spiritual maturity, and in favor with God and man. So he took it upon himself to grow in such a way that men would favor him. Hmm? You know, there comes a point in your life where if, you want, if you're going to grow the way God wants you to grow, you have to decide that you're going to quit living as a bully, that you're going to quit living as a bull in the china closet, that you're going to put your uh, wants, needs, desires down, and you're going to care about what other people think. I don't care what people think. Well, you're never going to be an effective Christian then. Hmm? Amen? There's a lot of things that I would love to come up here and say. Oh, if you only knew. But it's not going to increase in favor, and in the long run, I'm going to have much more effect in your life or other people's lives because I've taken upon myself to grow in favor with God and with man. Right? You make a self-conscious effort. You're self-motivated. Is that a good definition? Self-motivated and conscious of advancing in wisdom human maturity, and in favor with God and man. So Jesus was growing, listen, in his humanity because there was a living human spirit in him just like all of us and because he exercised a conscious advancement to grow. Conscious advancement. Now here's the third definition, all right? In the Greek text, the word grow also means that something or someone grows because it is acted upon by an outside power. It is acted upon by an outside power. Hmm? You get close to something that causes you to grow. It acts upon you from the outside. Now, 
with those definitions in mind, I want to take you to a very interesting set of scripture. And let me tell you how I got there. As I began to think about this, I wasn't thinking about it to preach it. I wasn't thinking about it to teach it to my church. I wasn't thinking about it because, you know, I had to come up with something at the start of the year. I was thinking about it for me. For me. Because I believe that God had given this word to me. And as a result of giving it to me, then I was to give it to my children, and I was to give it to my staff, and give it to my congregation. And anywhere else that he would have me teach it. All right? To grow. So as I thought about this, and I began to meditate upon this, and I was praying about it, I said, Lord, I really want to grow. And this thought came to me. And I asked myself, you know, what do I think, number one, what do I think is going to affect me the most to help me to grow? And this thought came to me. Man, if I want to grow, I need to get closer to God. How many of you agree with that, right? I mean, of all the things, and there's several things, if we have time tonight, I could teach you everything, but there are several things, right, that I could do, that I could think of, but one of them, without a doubt, to me, number one on the list was, man, if I, if I can get closer to God, I've got to get closer to God to grow. Amen? But when I thought that, I knew this verse of Scripture, and it came up to me. So turn with me to James, the fourth chapter. All right, James chapter 4. And I will say to you right now, buckle your seatbelts. James chapter 4. Now, the first thing that I began to think about this, while you're turning there, as I began to think about it, was this, right? You know, of all of the apostles, listen to me, of all the apostles... James spent more time with Jesus than any of them was his brother. Peter and John and the rest of them knew Jesus for three and a half years. James lived his whole life with him. If anybody knew the heart and the mind of the master, it was James. And I get a better amen than that, right? So when I began to think that way, I thought, you know what? I haven't given this guy the attention that I need to give him. Hmm? It's only got one book, but what a book. Wow, what a book. Huh? If anybody, after Jesus went to heaven, knew the voice of Jesus, it was James. He'd been around that voice all his life. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? So it's an incredible book, right? And he writes all kinds of things, okay? But he comes down here, for the sake of time, go with me to verse 6. He said, but he gives more grace. How many of you want God to give you more grace? grace. Isn't that a beautiful verse? I mean, I love that, right? I want more grace. What is grace? God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. It also means God's endowment of power to live the life that his grace has brought to you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Right? Through faith in Jesus Christ. All right? So grace brings salvation to you. Grace brings salvation to you. Grace, grace brings the life of God to you. Grace brings the kingdom of God to your life. And then grace empowers you to live in that kingdom and live the life that God wants you to live and live the way God wants you to live. You, are you with me so far? Grace doesn't mean you get to be you're saved, and you get to live like you weren't. I hear people tell me that all the time, right? Because I, I teach grace at my church. You know, and I have people come, and I hear, they don't tell me this, but I hear in the community, you know, I had a woman come to me not very long ago, and she said, you know, Pastor, I wish you'd never taught on grace at church. And I said, why? She said, because now my husband, my husband tells me all the time, well, I'm under grace now. I can drink, I can cheat on you, I can run around, I can do whatever I want. Because I'm under grace, and God still loves me. Hey, Bubba, hey, Bubba, God loved you before you were ever conceived. You need to get over this. All right? Grace doesn't mean God is not 
God has removed all boundaries off of your life. I'm, I'm going to just say this to you. All right? If you're in here tonight and you're thinking that, I seriously question if you were even born again. No, I, and, I, and I mean that lovingly. I seriously question if you're even born again. I seriously question. Because I don't think if Christ was in you that you would be looking to go back to the world that you say you left. That does not make sense to me. All right? So let's, let's go ahead. It says, but he gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, watch, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. He resists. Now, I looked up the word resist. The word resist means he sets an army against. Don't need that. Right? I mean, I read that. I said, I don't need that. I don't need God setting himself against me. I've got enough trouble with me. I got enough trouble with my own flesh. I got enough trouble with the devil, and I got enough trouble with crummy people. I don't need God setting himself against me. I don't. So I'm going to eliminate him from that equation. Right? So, so God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. He gives grace unto the humble. The word grace there means favor, goodwill, and acts of kindness. Sign me up for all of that. Right? Sign me up for God's favor, God's goodwill, and God's act of kindness. I'm up for that. Right? Sign me up for it. Okay? Sign up. Where do you sign up? You sign up at the humble table. That's what he said. He said he gives grace to the humble. Doesn't give grace to the proud. Doesn't give grace to the arrogant. He gives grace to the humble. All right? Now, watch me now. Just for the sake of time, jump with me down to verse 10. And he comes back and he says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And the word lift there means raise like we just read about grow. He will grow you. He will raise you. He will lift you. He will grow you. You will grow. And here he's back again about humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord. I'll, talk, I'll explain that to you in just a moment. All right? So now look at this. Go with me back to verse 6. Wherefore he saith unto the, unto, uh, wherefore he giveth more grace, for he saith God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore, <laughs> To God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. I find it fascinating to me that he tells us, okay, the proud get resistance, the grace get humble, in case you don't know which one to pick. <laughs> therefore, Submit yourself to me. Yeah. Hmm? To me, it's like Deuteronomy 30, right? I've said before you, life and death, blessing, cursing. Therefore, choose life. Yeah. Right? I mean, sometimes humans are not the sharpest pencil in the box. You know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the people that stayed home tonight. Yeah. Amen. All right, here we go. All right? He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I like that. Hmm? Now look at verse 8. He keeps talking. Draw nigh to God. What did we say? What brought us to this verse? I want to get closer to God. Right? I want to get closer to God, because if I get closer to God, somehow I know in my heart, if I get closer to God, I'll grow. If for no other reason, because the closer I get to him, the more he can act upon me as an outside power. And I want him acting upon me. How about you? 
I want him acting upon me. Amen. I don't want to be the same guy next week I am this week. I want to grow. I want to grow. I want my children to grow. I want my grandchildren to grow. I want my church to grow. I want my friends to grow. I want to grow. How many of you want to grow? I want to grow. Amen. So he says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Okay, now write this down. The word draw nigh means to approach God and worship. Approach God. Approach God and worship worship and God will approach you. In the Greek text it says to us to draw nigh to draw nigh to approach God and worship and God will approach you, but he does not worship us. And I think that shouldn't have to be said, but it needs to be said. Okay? We draw nigh to God and worship. You know what I discovered? Can I just be honest with you tonight? I I, as I was studying this, I, I had a real very powerful few moments in my life. And that was is that I had to admit to myself and admit to my father that in all of my life and all of the things I'm responsible for and all the things that I was doing, that I was not doing that. And that in fact, every day I spent more time drawing closer to family, my wife, all of which is important, and I need to do that. And kids and grandkids. And in fact, in truth, he, my Father, my Savior, the Holy Spirit, had been pushed to the sidelines. Except on Wednesday nights, Saturday nights, and Sunday mornings. And I still had my Bible readings at night, and I would uh, go through my confessions. I have scriptures I confess at night, and I would take communion. I take communion every night, and I would do that. But in fact, I would spend an hour and a half to two hours a day talking to my beautiful wife, and I would spend 15 minutes talking to my magnificent father. And so I had to make a change because I want to draw closer to him because in drawing closer to him I will grow amen, amen. amen. so I had to make a change and I started that change and I'm keeping that change and I'm not going to go back I'm going to keep that in my life and I'm going to keep that personal thing of drawing close to him and before I pray about this and pray about this and pray about that and pray about this and think about this and confess that and ask for help in this, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in just nothing but worship. Because you know why? I don't know about you, but I think that sometimes we forget that he is God. We become familiar in our position as children and him being our father, but he is also God. And he needs to be, in my heart, respected and awed and worshipped because he is God. Amen? And so, he says to draw nigh to that, right? And so, I had to ask myself, Am I going to grow up into him? How am I going to grow up into him when he is, in fact, on the sidelines compared to other things in my life? Listen, my family, he does not force himself into your life. Your Savior, your Father, the Holy Spirit are not loud and demanding and obtrusive. Yet we know that in order to grow, we need them acting upon us from the outside and the inside. We know we need them. You knew it before I said it to you tonight. That we need this. So I have to make a conscious effort, amen, to make this happen in my life. To make it happen in my church. As I was 
looking at this. A part of this teaching, if, if, if you heard all of it, I, I, I take you to Philippians 3 and verses 13 and 14, that if you're going to grow, you have to quit looking back. You've got to forget what's behind you and press towards what's in front of you because the past has, though the past is behind you and it's dead, it's like a hand comes out of the grave and grabs you and tries to pull you back into your past. Amen. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? And tries to pull you back. And Paul said, I forget those things that are behind me and I press forward because life is out in front of you. Amen. There's, all there is in your past is, is lessons to learn, but there's no life back there. It's dead. There, your life is in front of you, right? And one of the definitions of the word bless in the Bible means God causes your life to go forward to go forward. So if I'm not going forward, then in fact I'm not growing and I'm not experiencing the blessed life. Does that make sense to you, right? And so, you know, every preacher in here knows Philippians 3, 13 and 14, right? There's been millions of messages taught out of those verses and all of them, I think, were probably outstanding because I don't see how you can mess those verses up, <laughs> right? I mean, they are so incredible. Can I hear a good amen now, man? They're just so incredible, right? And, uh, and I've taught some beautiful messages out of that, right? But as I was looking at that, I went up to verse 12. And uh, I saw something I never remember seeing. Paul said, before he begins verse 13, Paul said, listen, Paul, That Paul. Paul said, I want to take hold of him who has taken hold of me. Listen to him. I want to take hold of him who has taken hold of me. And when I read that verse, I closed my eyes. And just like that, it's like God gave me like a vision in my heart. And that vision was, I saw me. And Jesus had a hold of me. He'd take he had his hands on my chest, on my shoulders, like this. And I was standing like this. Have you ever had, have you ever walked up and embraced somebody and they didn't embrace you back? It's really not comfortable, is it? Worse, have you ever embraced somebody who not only did not embrace you back, you could feel them pulling away from you? Or struggling? Right? The other day, my five-year-old grandson, Caleb, who is boy to the core, got really upset in the office. And he was, like, really upset. And so I went over to him, and I said, come here, Caleb. And I grabbed him, and he just, he didn't want to be, he didn't want his papa to hold him. He wanted to go punch some people out. And as I envisioned that, I saw myself, Jesus had his hands on me, and my hands were down, and I was. And I said, Charles, what's wrong with you? And what it is, it's our will, it's our rebelliousness, it's our wanting to still be in control of our lives, still wanting to hold on to our sin, our anger, our resentment, our bitterness, our unforgiveness, whatever it is, we want to hold on to that. And we're, right, we're glad he has a hold of us, but we're fighting him, right? And I heard him say in my heart what Paul said, I want to take hold of him. And I realized that if I would take hold of him, then both of us would relax. And then he can take me to where he wants me to go. Amen. So let's continue. We're almost there. Are you ready? A little bit more. He says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of God, and he shall lift you up. 
Now, what does he mean by these verses? I'll be honest with you, right? I've been teaching the Bible for over 45 years. I'm going to be totally honest with you. Up until a month ago, I avoided these verses. I avoided them. I avoided them. You know why I avoided them? Because I didn't understand them. But I began to look at them. And I said, what is he saying here? God wants me to grow. God wants me to get closer to him. God wants to affect me. God wants me to become the man that I can be. He doesn't want me to miss that. He wants me to be the man, the father, the grandfather, the husband, the pastor, the friend, the, pa the disciple, that he wants me to be. God's on my side, right? And so these verses are for my benefit. So what is he saying to me? Right? What I discovered was is that he makes the overall statement, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Right? He makes that statement. The word cleanse means purify yourself from the pollution and the guilt of sin. But listen to this. It means be free from the pollution of life. Do you know we live in a world that is polluted? Not just EPA polluted, polluted. We walk through this life and the world is constantly putting us ideas, thoughts, believing systems, philosophies, desires, affections, all kinds of stuff in us that have nothing to do with being a child of God and drawing closer to God. That in fact, I am polluted and I've got to admit that I, I am polluted, not because I sought to be, but because I live in a polluted world. Can I get a good amen tonight, right? And so I want to be free from that pollution. Just because the world says, think this way, maybe I shouldn't think that way. Because the world says, well, everybody's doing it, doesn't necessarily mean I, as a child of God, should be doing it. Is it going to make me grow? Is it going to draw me closer? No, I need to be free from the pollution of the world. So I have to guard my heart. Amen? Because if I don't, my mind and my affections are going to be all over the place. All over the place. Amen? Then he gives you the overall statement, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Then he begins to break it down. So the first statement is cleanse your hands. Then he tells you how to do it. So let me give it to you real quick. Right? The word purify means to render pure in a moral sense. Render yourself pure in a moral sense. So how are my morals? You won't hear that on CNN tonight or Fox News. Ain't nobody talking to you out in the world about your morals. Because the world, the pollution of the world is we need to get rid of morals. Morals are old-fashioned. You guys are antiquated. The church is out of touch. We've got it figured out. You ain't got nothing figured out. World, you are so jacked up, you don't know up from down anymore. All right, and I don't say that judgmentally. To me, it's just an observation. And I'm not going to let jacked up is in the Greek text. It's in there somewhere. That's according to the Texas Bible right there, all right? And uh, so... You know, so I need, I need to look at myself, right, to, pure, to render myself pure in a moral sense, to consecrate. That's not a word you hear in church anymore. I'm trying to bring that word back. We need more of that thought, that idea of living a consecrated life. See, it's not popular, right? I mean, I set you up and about five of you went, amen. It's not popular. People don't want to hear that. Well, you better hear it. Do you want to grow? Or do you want to be the same old, same old 20 years from now? Okay. What does the word heart mean? The Bible, the Bible dictionary says the heart is God's sphere of influence in your life. God's sphere of influence in your life. Hmm? It also says that your heart is where your desires, your feelings, whoo, your affections, 
your passions and your impulses reside. Now, I don't know about you, but I need all of God's influence I can get on my desires, my feelings, my affections, my passions, help me, and my impulses. So I've got to make a concentrated effort to make this happen. Double-minded. Listen to this. You're going to love it. Are you learning anything? We're almost done. About five more minutes, okay? Double-minded means divided loyalties. Now, I read this in a Bible dictionary. Listen, I'm going to read it to you exactly what I read in a Greek, English, New Testament dictionary, right? What does it mean? What is the, what, in the Bible, what do they mean by divided loyalties? This is what the writer of the dictionary said. A man that has divided loyalties or is double-minded, listen, on the one hand, listen, listen to the words. On the one hand, he wishes to maintain a Christian profession and desires the presence of God in his life. So on the one hand, he wishes to maintain a Christian profession and desires the presence of God in his life. On the other hand, Listen, he loves. There's a big difference in life between wishing and loving. Hmm? Big difference. See an old rock and roll song. Part of it was, who do you love? Hmm? Doesn't matter who you wish you were with, who do you love? What do you love? Let me read to you again. On the one hand, he wishes to maintain a Christian profession, and desires the presence of God in his life. I looked at that and said, that's me. But on the other hand, he loves the ways of the world and prefers to live according to its moral views and ethics. So if I'm going to draw nigh to God, I've got to deal with that in my life. I've got to be honest in my life. Is that me? Do I, on the one hand, say, oh, I want people to think of me as a Christian. Oh, I want the presence of God in my life. But wow, that looks good. That looks fun. Oh, yeah, the Bible says, well, I don't care what the Bible says. <laughs> All my friends are doing this. All, woo! Almost there. Here we go. Now watch what he says. He said, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaven. And so, is this, See, this is the verse that always bothered me. So is God saying to us that as the the proper Christian is the Christian that walks around, never smiles, never happy, always depressed, always sad, always beat up, always grouchy, always judgmental, always fault finding, because that's what it appears. But you got to remember my family, hear me now, when you read your Bible, one verse got to be read in the light of all the other verses that talk about the same thing. Now, God is not saying that as Christians we are not to have joy because we all know that joy gives you strength, right? We all know that that the Bible says God will turn your mourning, huh? That he'll bring joy to your life, that he'll bring laughter out of ashes, that he'll bring rivers in the desert, right? All of those good things. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, right? So what is he talking about here? I don't have time to break it down for you. I've run out of time. What he's plainly saying to us here tonight is, Charles, if you want to grow in me, if you want to be affected by me, son, you got to quit laughing at sin in your life. You got to quit being okay with sin in your life. 
you got to deal with it, boy. It's not because I love you more, but because it's messing up your life. It's pulling you away from us. It's keeping you from enjoying the life we want you to have. If you want us to affect you, you've got to quit laughing at sin. I was studying this just, just when I was studying for myself. I went into a, into a Starbucks there at my house, right? And uh, there was a group of guys sitting. No, at a, I went into, it wasn't there, it was in a restaurant. And I went in to eat lunch, and there was four guys at a table. It was on a Monday, right? Four young guys at a table, right? Probably in their 20s, early 30s. And all they were doing was laughing at how drunk they had gotten on the weekend and how much trouble they were in with their wives and how they were laughing at it. Oh, man, you should have seen us, man. We were so stupid drunk. I spent the whole Saturday night around the toilet, man. I puked my guts out. And then on Sunday, woo, 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 we went and got so high, man. I got so high, I didn't know where I was, man. Oh, and I'm just sitting there looking at them like, And I'm judging them, but this happens to me all the time. When God is teaching me something, literally, I'll go out into the world and I'll see it. Because Proverbs 3 says, wisdom cries in the streets. If you open your eyes, man, God can teach you so many things just walking down the street. Hmm? You know, people ask me all the time, Pastor, you're not... How did you learn to treat your wife so good? By watching other people. <laughs> By sitting in my office for 40 years, listening to the dummies tell me their stories. <laughs> hmm? And I'd say, Bubba, who told you to treat your wife that way? My dad. And who taught him? His dad. And how many times your grandfather married? Four. How many times your daddy been divorced? Three. How many times your brother's been divorced? Two, two, four. And you're next. I looked at one guy not very long ago and I said, hey man. I said, you hear that water sound? He went, what, what? I said, that water sound is you're in the toilet and your wife is flushing it. He flushing your marriage down the toilet, Bubba. And he's going to cry, and he's going to lose weight, and he's going to get in the gym, and he's going to get all in shape, and he's going to say sorry. But all of that could have been avoided if you'd have been smart enough to come to James 4 and go, wait a minute, sin ain't funny. Hmm? All right, here's the wrap-up. Here's the hot fudge on your ice cream, right? So he says all of that. So when it comes to sin, I need to be afflicted. I need to mourn. I need to weep over sin. Amen? I need to quit laughing at it and mourn it. I need to quit being joyful about it and be heavy about it. Then he says, humble yourselves in the sight of God. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. The word humble there means through repentance. Get ready. It means detest sin and purpose to change. Detest sin. Detest it. Let's quit being okay with sin. Oh, but Pastor, God loves me. That's not the issue, my brother. That's not the issue, my sister. The issue is not whether God loves you or not. The issue is God has always loved you and God will always love you. Do you know why God has always loved you and will always love you? Because God is love. He cannot help but love you. He is love. Love is not something he has. It is what he is. God is love. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. The issue is, are you going to experience God? 
Are you going to be impacted by God in your life? Are you going to grow in God? Are you going to have the life that God wants you to have? And you're not going to have it. I'm not going to have it as long as I keep saying, well, but, but all the men in my family are angry, or, or that guy over there, or this woman over there, or that group over there, or this people over here, or that one over there. I never, right, right. Stop it. Mourn that. Quit being proud of your sin. Quit laughing at sin in your life. Humble yourself by repentance, detesting the sin. And what will God do to you? He will raise you up. Let me give you that definition, then I promise you I'm done. You'll love it. The word lift you up means he will raise you to a condition of prosperity, dignity, and honor. He will raise you up. Amen? Stand to your feet with me, please. Can we pray for just a minute? Would you lift your hands towards heaven with me tonight? Well, I don't like to lift my hands. But would you do it because God told you to? Just maybe once in your life, just do something out of obedience instead of Lord we honor you tonight and God I believe that I pray tonight for all of us in here and watching online tonight Lord my father my savior I want to take hold of you like you have taken hold of me. I don't want to fight you anymore. I don't want to resist you anymore. And I'm willing to admit to you tonight, Lord, that sin, that the world has probably polluted me. My attitudes, my affections, my desires, my thinking, my priorities. And Lord, I repent of it tonight. I want to be cleansed. I cleanse myself. I want to grow. I am motivated to grow. And to grow, I, I know I need to get closer to you. And I'm telling you tonight, Lord, I'm not going to laugh at sin in my life. I'm not going to be proud of it. I'm not going to hide behind it. I'm not going to justify it, whether it's my anger or my unforgiveness or my hatred. No more. In fact, I detest it. It's not my friend. It's not here to help me. It's hindering me. Lord, I know you love us. You believe in us. You have an incredible plan and will for our lives. And Lord, we open ourselves up to that tonight. We humble ourselves before you tonight. We humble ourselves in your sight. I don't care what my family thinks of me. I don't care what my brothers and sisters and parents, I don't care. I care about how you see me. What am I in your sight? That's what matters. Because at the end of my life, you'll be waiting for me. No one else. I want to be like Paul and say, I ran my race. I obtained my prize. And there's laid up for me a reward in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.